Hi, I'm Patrick Scott. Welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. Today and over the next couple of sessions, we're going to be talking about foreign and defense policy and the making of foreign and defense policy. And we'll be covering a variety of questions. I want to go ahead and throw some of these questions out to you as we, as we talk about this. Let me go ahead and throw some of these out to you ahead of time. One of the things we want to look at is, for example, what are the factors that are changing uh, U.S. foreign and defense policies? Uh, what is the history of U.S. foreign and defense policy? And what does it tell us about America's role in the world today? Who is involved in the making of U.S. foreign and defense policies and what specific roles do they play? What are the sources of diplomatic power that we have available to those who conduct American foreign policy? And what are the issues and choices facing those who make U.S. defense policies today? Now, starting out, if we go back and look at our Constitution, our preamble to our Constitution, one of the most fundamental purposes of our government is to provide for the common defense. Now, today, how that sort of translates is that a key question is, how involved should the United States be in world affairs today? And in fact, that question has kind of permeated our history in terms of our involvement in foreign affairs to a greater or lesser degree. Today, are we more secure um, and, and are, do we achieve greater security by having more active engagement in world affairs? Or instead, do we achieve greater security by having less engagement in world affairs? Should America play a leading role uh, overseas and, and work with international bodies like the United Nations uh, on an active basis? Um, should there be multilateral exchanges or engagements or commitments? Uh, should the U.S. be a uh, world leader in trying to promote democracy overseas? And then, of course, should the U.S. be the world's police force? Uh, should we stop atrocities that are being committed in other countries? And if we let the atrocities continue, might that in itself be an indication of U.S. vulnerability and weakness? Do we have an obligation as a country to help root out starvation and diseases like AIDS in Africa? Or do we have an obligation to root out and deal with human rights abuses in countries like China? And then, of course, what about even a whole different range of issues like environmental issues, such as global warming and the production of CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that are going around that, you know, that, that deplete our ozone? And what role should the United States play and should play a leading role in terms of creating international obligations and commitments toward reducing CFC emissions? Now, uh, again, along the same lines, a, a question that has continually plagued uh, us in terms of developing policy is how much money should we be sp uh, spending to ensure our security? How much is enough? How much is too much? Um, and of course, this has become a, had become a very important topic of debate over the last several years, particularly since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and in fact, I would say this too, as, as by matters of starting out, Perhaps the most important influence on defense policy since World War II has been, for many, many years, this adversarial relationship that we had with the Soviet Union. And events like the Berlin blockade, the Korean War, the Cuban Missile Crisis in Vietnam are all examples of uh, instances that are tied to this adversarial relationship that we've had with the Soviet Union. And this is part of the Cold War era that we'll be talking about. And in addition, in addition to, in our history, to conventional conflicts like Vietnam and Korea, uh, of course, there's been also concerns about the nuclear arms race, a buildup of arms between the U.S. and Soviet Union and other countries now. And this buildup of, ar of arms over the, over the last 50 years or so has created a cache of, of nuclear weapons that are capable of destroying the world several times over. Now again, today the Soviet Union no longer exists, but I think ironically the situation may be more dangerous today than ever before. For example, instead of negotiating with one country, the Soviet Union, we now have to negotiate with several countries that came out of that breakup of, that, of the Soviet Union. Uh, for example, Belarus, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Russia, uh, Ukraine. And recently there was something in the news about Russia providing Iran with nuclear materials. Okay. And then, of course, we have other hot spots, too, besides Iraq and North Korea, uh, just the Middle East in general. And then we also have to decide how quickly and in how many simultaneous situations are we prepared to respond to conflicts overseas. Should we be prepared to fight two major conflicts at the same time or three? And so, again, there's, there are a lot of questions here that really 
garner a lot of time and attention of U.S. policymakers because of these very, very, very pressing issues and, and, and situations that which we now uh, face or find ourselves facing. If we were to go back and talk a little bit about the historical overview of our U.S. foreign policy, and I want to spend a few minutes doing this, let's talk about some of this and, and sort of where, where we started here. I think, first of all, one of the things I'd like to talk about is how, in a lot of ways, the United States has always shied away from becoming overly involved in world affairs, at least for a, a good portion of the history of our country. During the 1800s, for example, America took a posture called isolationism. And isolationism basically was to avoid direct involvement in European affairs. And that characterized much of our foreign policy. Uh, back when James Monroe was president, he enunciated something called the Monroe Doctrine back in 1823. And what, what the Monroe Doctrine basically says is the United States would stay out of European affairs as long as Europe stayed out of the Western Hemisphere. So the Western Hemisphere was something that we came to look upon as our own backyard, that is Latin America, for example, um, and Europe should stay out of that. And again, we will not, as, as in return for that, we will not meddle in Europe's affairs. So isolationism in this respect really meant not isolationism, isolationism from all kinds of entanglements, but, uh, but primarily it was applied to those affairs across the Atlantic in Europe. Now, also going on this time besides this, this ten, tendency toward isolationism, this period of the 1800s was also marked by uh, another tendency called expansionism. As you remember maybe the term manifest destiny, the phrase manifest destiny. This is the idea of trying to expand our, our boundaries from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from sea to shining sea. And there are a lot of the notable uh, acquisitions of uh, purchases we, we had made or acquired you know, during this time. Uh, for example, of course, the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Uh, during this time also, we acquired Alaska from Russia. Uh, we obtained portions of the Southwest from Mexico from 1846 to 1848. Uh, the Spanish-American War in 1898, we actually obtained Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, Cuba, and the Philippines. And of course, during this time, the U.S. actively intervened in the, the affairs of Latin America. But again, following the, the Monroe Doctrine principles, we tried to stay out of Euro European affairs by and large. So, a lot of ways then, the 1800s, much of the 1800s could be characterized in terms of foreign policy by internal expansionism, but at the same time, isolationism from other ent foreign entanglements. Now, from about 19, the 1900s, things changed quite dramatically, and from 1914 all the way through 1960, you know, America as a country emerged as, as a world leader. Um, if we go back to World War I, there was a lot of resistance about getting involved in World War I. But we had to make the world safe for democracy, to use Woodrow Wilson's terms. We still believe very strongly in isolationism, but we felt compelled to make the world safe for democracy at the same time. After we had gotten involved in World War I, uh, and, uh, and after, at the end of the war, Wilson, uh, what President Woodrow Wilson played a major role in helping to start an international body called the League of Nations. But there were a lot of strong isolationist pressures in our country, and they were so strong that the Senate did not ratify the treaty to approve our involvement and our participation in the League of Nations. And because the United States was not participating in the League of Nations, the League of Nations did not last very long at all. And in the 1920s and 1930s, there was still a very strong uh, feeling of isolationism. As you remember, in the 1920s, the, the late 1920s, the Great Depression set in, and many people believe that the Great Depression was exacerbated, brought on and even exacerbated in part because of too much involvement in Europe, in this case, particularly in terms of commercial affairs. Uh, there was something called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff that took place, and, and that had a lot of reverberations, and that uh, European countries also then enacted tariffs and stopped our exports. But because of that, though, the, the idea that there was too much uh, intertwinement of our commercial and foreign affairs uh, with European countries, that, that helped brought on the, the, the onset of the Great Depression. Now, um, of course, World War II, in a lot of ways, forced us out of our isolationist posture. We had to respond to the threat of Hitler and, and to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And so we've got become very, very involved here in, in World War II, obviously, in playing a major role. 
At the conclusion of World War II in 1946, we, uh, the, the United Nations was created, and this time we became active participants and played a leading role in the establishment of the United Nations. During the same time, we began to see the rising influence of the, uh, the Soviet Union, the USSR. Back in 1917, they had fallen under communist control under uh, Lenin and um, uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution and, uh, and, and had gotten rid of their czar and their monarchical system and they became a totalitarian regime. They began to uh, engage in expansionism and they began to tighten their hold, its hold, on Eastern Europe. And they created this, uh, something called the Warsaw Pact and the Iron Curtain. And uh, as a response to that, we saw a growing threat of the Soviet Union. And when they began to uh, set off the height, when they set off the hydrogen bomb, they, we realized that they were very, very close to us in terms of their nuclear technology. Um, in response to the creation of the Warsaw Pact, which was a military alliance of Eastern European nations, and they had lined up all their uh, tanks and troops on Eastern uh, European borders with the Western Europe. In response to that, we created and participated fully in something called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, tre Treaty Organization in 1949. And it basically the creation of NATO and with, along with the creation of the Warsaw Pact really marked the beginning of the Cold War. And the Cold War was basically marked over a period of years by a very high level of tension between the United States and the Soviet Union and its allies. The United States with its allies, the Soviet Union uh, with its allies, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. The basically the way the word was created during that time was almost like a bipolar conception of the word where you had two strong superpowers with their troops on the border ready to invade at any time and both amassing through technology uh, nuclear materials and nuclear weapons. Um, so we have two superpowers and, and this was simply not, not uh, a mere, mere idle threat because in a lot of ways this was an ideological battle. We feared communism. Uh, we felt like communism, which uh, was the ideology behind the, uh, the Soviet system, we felt like, like communism was on the rampage and we needed to stop it everywhere we could. And the creation of NATO, interestingly, signaled an end to our isolationist posture because the creation of NATO meant that we were committed to the security of Western Europe from communist attack. And during this time, Harry Truman was our president. And during this time, President Truman enunciated something called the Truman Doctrine. And the idea behind the Truman Doctrine was that we would, be, we would protect free people all around the world. Our security and world peace demanded that we protect all free peoples of the world. All right, and that was pretty expansive if you think about that. Again, we believe that the Soviet Union sought after world domination. Soviet uh, uh, leaders proclaimed it in their speeches. There was a very famous um, uh, footage of uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the Soviet premier, who addressed the United Nations. And he took off his shoe and banged his shoe on the podium and said, we will bury you. So again, we took the threat very, very seriously. It was up to us to try to contain the influence of, this, of communism all around the world. There was a belief in this idea of the domino theory. And that is, if one country fell to communist control, like dominoes, other countries nearby may also fall to communist control. And we had to stop the spread of communism like we would stop the spread of dominoes falling down. So we created, through this, a policy of containment. And under this policy of containment, we began to provide aid to countries that we thought were vulnerable uh, to the Soviets and Soviet influence. But interestingly, not only Soviet influence, but any other kind of communist influence as well, because China had become communist under Mao Zedong in the late 1940s, and we had to stop communists anywhere, any way, shape, or form. So the policy of containment resulted, in terms of the tangible outputs of that policy, it resulted in our providing greater amounts of foreign aid to countries that we thought might be vulnerable to falling into communist hands. And we would apply this aid to countries around the world. So in 1950, for example, we tried to contain the influence or the Soviet and Chinese influence in Korea by committing troops to help support the South Koreans. And of course, that was led to the Korean conflict. In 
And then of course during the 1950s and 1960s, we saw a similar pattern happening in Vietnam. We began to support South Vietnam uh, to help contain the influence of the Viet Cong in North uh, Vietnam uh, under uh, th their leaders and under uh, Chinese uh, influence. Now a real test also came in 1962. We actually almost went to war with the Soviet Union. It was over, over Cuba. In fact, uh, this, and this would have been probably a nuclear war had we gone to war with them. This was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this was really in a lot of ways the hottest Cold War encounter between the Soviet Union and the United States. And what was happening in 1962 is that the Soviet Union began shipping nuclear missiles to a communist controlled country. Fidel Castro took over uh, Cuba and here was a country just, just miles on our border under communist control now, communist domination. And, um, and the Soviet Union in 1962 began shipping missiles, uh, nuclear missiles to Cuba. The United States demanded that the Soviets dismantle the missile sites. All of those missile sites, by the way, were aimed at the United States. And of course, if they continued, that would have given us practically no lead time should there be a nuclear attack. And so we demanded the Soviets to mis dismantle those sites and uh, halt the shipment of more missiles coming into Cuba. We went so far even to set up a blockade around Cuba. Our Navy set up a blockade and we were prepared to go to war if we had to. And this encounter, this standoff, lasted for 13 days and it literally almost took us to the brink of war with the Soviet Union. Finally, the Soviet Union agreed to dismantle the missile sites in return for U.S. assurances that we would be doing the same thing by removing some of our missiles from Turkey because we had missile sites established in Turkey, Turkey and those missiles were aimed at the Soviet Union. So again, that was a very, very hard, a uh, very, very uh, close encounter that we had with the Soviet Union. So now, and now, as we continued here, again, throughout the 60s and, and, and then 1970, you might say in the 70s really marked more of a bit of a cooling off or a period of relaxation of tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, Richard Nixon was our president uh, during that time and he in initiated a policy of what's called detente with the Soviet Union, the establishment of agreements with the Soviet Union, in which again tried to create a relaxation of tension. Richard Nixon went over to the Soviet Union and actually broadcast on TV over there. Uh, uh, the Soviet premier Leonid Brezhnev came over to the United States and, uh, and again trying to create more positive agreements and we also began the start of some uh, talks designed to limit nuclear weapons. Uh, we were also at the same time trying to open up relations with China uh, with the idea that if we can open up relations with that co communist country, uh, there are some tensions between the USSR and China and if we could somehow exploit some of those tensions and kind of what they call play the China card as a way to kind of buffer our relationship with the Soviet Union, that was considered to be in our strategic and national interest to do so. So during the 1970s, and again, we had some, some, some significant talks aimed at reducing uh, the number of nuclear warheads, nuclear weapons that we had in our respective inventories, and uh, overall a period of relaxation of tensions. But, the same, but, but the, by the end of the decade, uh, the tensions flared back up again because in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. President Jimmy Carter uh, at the time uh, uh, responded uh, in 1980, in fact, uh, the, we had the, the, the uh, Olympics and in Moscow and we did not participate in the Olympics at that time. Uh, during that time also, we, we saw not only the Soviet Union invading Afghanistan, there wasn't really a whole lot that we did about that except try to provide some assistance to uh, resistance fighters over there, the Mujahideen. Uh, to try to help them. The CIA provided some weapons and some training, some technical assistance to the Mujahideen to, as, uh, in terms of guerrilla warfare and guerrilla tactics. Uh, at the same time, in 1979, going back to 1979, uh, during that year, Iran, uh, uh, the, the Iranian regime, the Shah of Iran fell uh, under the influence of Ayatollah Khomeini and uh, during that time, uh, during that revolution, uh, the, the Iranians took Amer American hostages. They, they uh, uh, overran our embassy and they took American hostages. Uh, 
So we felt vulnerable in a couple of different ways. Here we couldn't stop the Soviet influence in Afghanistan. We saw the Soviets once again for the invaders and trying to uh, establish communism influence all over the world. And, and we felt vulnerable because of what was happening to our, our embassy in, in Tehran, Iran. So we felt vulnerable and we needed a strong leader. And so uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was running for president and he basically said, you know, elect me and uh, we will uh, I will help America become strong again. I will achieve peace through strength. And so during the Reagan administration, the 1980s, we began to witness the largest peacetime military buildup that the world had ever seen. The Soviet Union, by the way, tried to match up their buildup with our buildup as well. Uh, and that had some consequences toward the end of that decade. Um, but in any case, uh, we would achieve peace through strength. And one of the ways in which we would do this also is through engaging in a lot of research and development. You may have heard of the term Star Wars. A lot of R&D funds were beginning to be allocated, billions of dollars, toward a, a Star Wars program that was an anti-ballistic missile defense pro uh, 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 program, a nuclear shield that might, if, if, an, if it would work, would stop nuclear missiles, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles from coming in from the Soviet Union into our atmosphere. So we began to see a lot of uh, research and development toward the Star Wars program. Under Reagan then we really stepped up our defense spending um, and we provided aid to a lot of countries to contain communists, the spread of communism. We provided a lot of aid and assistance to El Salvador. Uh, we tried to fight uh, the, uh, the Sandinistas who had taken control in Nicaragua and we were providing aid to what was called the Freedom Fighters to, to overturn and, and uh, the, uh, overthrow the regime in, in Nicaragua. Um, during the same time, we tried to control the export of sensitive, sensitive technologies and high-tech goods to the Soviet bloc uh, and to uh, China as well. And uh, so again, we saw some different ways in which we're trying to stop the influence of the Soviet Union. Now, at the end of that decade, in the late, late 1989, the, the communist leaders of many of the Eastern European nations began to lose their hold. Uh, many of the communist regimes were, were, were being toppled. Uh, for example, Hungary, um, Poland, uh, and, uh, and the labor movement of Lech Walesa, for example, in Poland, leading toward democratic change in these countries. And interestingly, during this time, um, the president, Gorbachev of, 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 of Russia, was, was trying to achieve some democratization and some, some movements toward reforms and a, a, a policy of glasnost and opening of their society. And interestingly, when we saw so a couple of trends that were going on in, to, in the Soviet Union, and more of an opening of and uh, some, some fundamental reforms from traditional communist control, and when we saw how democracy began to take hold in Hungary and Poland, and the Soviet Union did nothing to stop this. And then in East Germany, uh, the Berlin Wall came down, and German troops uh, took, uh, I'm sorry, Germany, uh, the German government took steps toward reunification, and the Soviet Union did nothing to stop this. And in Czechoslovakia, we saw what was called the Velvet Revolution, where almost overnight the country became democratic under, under uh, Havel. And so um, all of these different kinds of changes, we begin to look over in Eastern Europe and say well, the democracy is spreading over there and the Soviet Union is doing nothing to stop it. Now we, happened, we did happen to see, however, uh, communism clamped down in another country that year, in 1989, and that was in China, when you had a democratic movement uh, in uh, China and many protests at Tiananmen Square. And we saw some uh, brutal suppression of democracy of China in Tiananmen Square. And that um, and I, I, it was almost as if the Chinese leaders were looking at these events at the same time and taking that as a, play, as a lesson of what not to do in terms of allowing for democratic reforms to continue. So we saw a clamping down of democracy on the one hand in China. We saw in the Eastern Europe more of an opening up of democracy. And uh, in 1991, uh, we had the Soviet Union uh, disintegrated. Uh, there was an attempted coup against Gorbachev. Uh, Boris Yeltsin took control of the, of the government and, 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 and tried to Im immediately institute democratic reforms. So we see here in 1991 then um, uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, all the former, many of the former Soviet, Soviet states declaring democracy, George H.W. Bush as president uh, granting recognition to, to former Baltic countries under, under the Eastern Bloc such as Estonia, 
Litvia, Lat, uh, Lit I'm sorry, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and uh, recognizing the giving formal recognition to those countries. So a lot of the events were happening here in the, in the early 1990s. And of course, not to mention our war with Iraq, with uh, Saddam Hussein. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, we immediately took steps to, to uh, send troops over there to quell that invasion. And uh, we, uh, we achieved our military objectives very, very quickly. So a lot of things that were going on during, during that period of time, um, and that helped to establish the sense of, us, of, of, of basically the uh, dominance of the United States. Uh, especially again, going back to the Soviet Union and, the, and their collapse, this superpowers of being two different, you know, two, two superpowers is no longer the case. It was almost as if the United States was the single remaining superpower left. Now, of course, the Soviet Union was very, very powerful. None, none, I mean, the former Soviet Union, Russia, uh, and other countries were very, very powerful, had a lot of these weapons. And uh, there was also a lot of concern, too, because of economic collapse going on. And we were very much concerned about how we were going to deal with these countries. In fact, one of the things we were concerned about even there was that uh, maybe many of the scientists who had worked in the nuclear programs were now, now and, and who were communists, we're now seeing that, that uh, their salaries were going to practically nothing because of this internal economic collapse in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. And so we thought it might be very, very easy for, the, for, for these uh, individuals to uh, basically put their technical know-how up for sale and give it to the highest bidder. And so we were concerned about nuclear technology being spread or even you know, plutonium and uranium and other important nuclear materials you know, being uh, exported out secretly out of the Soviet Union, going to who knew who knew where, and so we actually began to put Soviet physicists and scientists on U.S. payroll to help prop up, you know, uh, their you know that's the stability in those countries. Um, so we see a lot of that going on throughout the 1990s and so forth, and so, and basically, of course, uh, what was a very important and significant up since that point, of course, was uh, in 2001 in 9-11 with the, uh, the bombing of the uh, trade towers in, in New York, the collapse of those, um, and, the, and with the terrorists from, from Afghanistan. And so immediately we took steps to remove the Taliban from control in Afghanistan. And of course in 2003, um, George W. Bush uh, began to make the argument and from intelligence that he had, uh, uh, you know, the, his administration had amassed of what weapons of mass destruction, the evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and, um, and that we needed to remove the weapons of mass destruction. And that precipitated our invasion in 2003 in Iraq. So again, this is sort of a, a, sort of a whirlwind tour of our history. But I guess what this, the question is, is that, okay, so we, today we see ourselves in a very different kind of situation. And in fact, just a few years ago, we were talking about with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that you know, we don't have to have military bases all around the world anymore. And all those military bases across the United States, we don't have to worry about. We can collapse, you know, cut back many of these. And they talked about this notion of a peace dividend. You know, all the money that we're spending on the military, we can now cut back, put that money back into people's pockets, cut back on taxes, cut back on government spending, uh, or use that spending for other kinds of purposes for domestic programs. And there's a very famous kind of debate called guns versus butter, where you had to make a decision about how much money you're going to be allocating toward your defense budget versus your domestic priorities. And so this guns versus butter debate was, was happening at that time, thinking that you know, we're, we can really cut back on the guns and have a lot more money available for domestic priorities now and increase our spending in that way. So we could either increase that or cut back on our spending overall and reduce our deficit and, and potentially reduce our uh, overall uh, debt, our, our national debt. But of course that changed dramatically with uh, the events of 9-11 and then our subsequent invasion uh, of Iraq. So today then we have a very, very different kind of situation here. You know, we've got the high military defense deficits that are, that are, that are, are continuing to plague our economy. And uh, we have to think about, you know, what kind of defense structure do we need to have in place? Now that the Soviet Union is no longer the same threat, but nonetheless we still have the same kinds of threats from the other potential countries that the former Soviet Union is making sure that we have clearly negotiated and effective agreements in place to control the spread of nuclear technology. And then we think about rogue nations who are trying to uh, obtain nuclear technology potentially and of course the threat of terrorism around the world. And, uh, and, and how, how do we stop, for example, plutonium getting into terrorist hands? And so 
again, it's a very different kind of world out there in a lot of ways from uh, the point I was talking about at the very beginning of this discussion. In a lot of ways, we are not necessarily in any way safer that the Soviet Union has collapsed. So the questions that face us today are things like, you know, what is or should be the future role of the United States in world affairs? Should we be the police, you know, the, the war policeman, you know? Uh, if, sh if so, should we go it alone or act in concert with other nations such as the United Nations? How much, to what extent should we be working cooperatively with the United Nations and how much should we be engaged in multilateral agreements as opposed to engaging in what's called unilateral actions. To the extent that we engage in more multilateral agreements with other countries, the real fear among a lot of people here in the United States is that we begin to surrender some of our sovereignty to these other nations. And again, what would be the advantage of doing that? Well, we may save money in terms of military uh, 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 and various kinds of military engagements overseas because we are now working multilaterally with other nations so we're not going it alone that's going to save money and if we're engaging in multilateral actions and working with uh, in terms of getting agreement with many other nations in terms of our actions that may also accord a sense of legitimacy in terms of our actions worldwide but again at what price and one of those prices might be the sense of surrender our, of our sovereignty and so the, again that's sort of an ongoing debate about to what extent should we be doing things cooperatively with other nations in, in, in the foreign policy arena versus going at it alone. And again, since the end of the Cold War, which is pretty much both the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that marked the end of the Cold War, you know, are we a safer place? You know, of course, we still have the threat of nuclear war. Uh, the republics of Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Georgia, and others still have nuclear weapons and materials, as I mentioned. We have to conduct separate negotiations with each. Um, we are concerned about, again, these, the former Soviet scientists might be willing to sell, sell their expertise to the highest bidder. That's still an ongoing concern. We're concerned, obviously, in the Middle East, uh, in terrorism uh, such as Hamas and Al-Qaeda and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we're concerned about North Korea, their instability in, the, in their pursuit of nuclear weapons. We're concerned about Iran and fundamentalist hardliners who, who want to pursue nuclear technology. So all of these things really occupy, and they appropriately occupy much of our time and attention. Um, we're certainly also concerned about relations between India and Pakistan as well. Uh, and we're concerned about, for example, Pakistan's ability to deal with Al-Qaeda, especially along its regions and provinces, that border, Afga that border between Afghanistan and, and uh, Pakistan. And, and those parts of Pakistan, how well is Pakistan able to, to control some of these provinces? Um, and um, we also need to think about, uh, you know, things in a long-term kind of, kind of fashion. Um, I had mentioned, for example, that, you know, we were, when the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan back in 1979, we trained a group called the Mujahideen. Uh, they, were, they were fundamentalist in their Islamic religion, and one of these, quote, freedom fighters was Osama bin Laden. And the CIA trained Osama bin Laden and, and other Mujahideen and provide them weapons and materials, trained them in guerrilla warfare tactics, supplied them with sophisticated weapons to fight the Soviets. And I think bin Laden learned well from these kinds of things. But what this underscores here is the need for us to take a long-term view of our, you know, in terms of our foreign policy. Uh, homeland security is a big issue these days. We're concerned about homeland security after the events of 9-11. It show, you know, the 9-11 event showed us how vulnerable that we were. Um, and then even with Iraq today, even though we're in the process of drawing down troops, uh, we don't want to do so precipitously because if we do that too quickly, we end up creating greater instability in the process. And then potentially, uh, we, we don't want all the effort we put into Iraq to end up becoming a haven for terrorism, and, a, and we don't want Iraq to disintegrate into a civil war between various ethnic groups such as the Sunnis, the Shias, and the Kurds. So again, a lot of these questions you see make the formation and creation of foreign policy a very, very complicated endeavor. And we continue to ask ourselves, to what extent should we try to promote and export democracy? Is that the best way to help make us safe? Uh, will the promotion of democracy work
when we try to import it into cultures that do not have a tradition of democratic rule and governance or institutions. You know, if there's very little history of democracy at work, how well does the export of uh, promotion of democracy work in those kinds of cultures? And there have been a lot of interesting views and ideas that have uh, d been discussed about this, but again, talking about our role in the world, uh, one, one of the reminds me of here is uh, the idea uh, that some of the views of a foreign State Department official, Strobe Talbot, and he, in a very influential piece, he wrote about support for democracy in the national interest. Now, we'll say this real, real briefly here uh, before we conclude our discussion today. And one of the things that Strobe Talbot believes is that our foreign policy, of course, has gotten more complicated, and it's good to support the transition to democracies because it does help our own prosperity in terms of expanding opportunities for trade and investment. And one of the points that he makes, and I think this is a very valid point, is that when you compare uh, countries that have dictatorships or other forms of totalitarian rule, democracies are much more likely to be reliable partners in trade, and they're much more likely to pursue policies that are compatible with their own interest. Uh, democracies are less likely to go to war with each other, to uh, unleash tidal waves of refugees, and to create environmental catastrophes and to engage in terrorism. Um, elected leaders in other countries, because they know that they will be held accountable at the ballot box, are more likely to also pay attention to citizens' basic needs. So his argument, and the argument that many people have, is that our national interest is expanded when we actively promote democracy around the world. We need to expand and secure the community of nations that share our values and have compatible interests. It's an investment in our long-term security. Uh, fledgling, fledgling democracies certainly need our help. Uh, if they don't, they can easily revert to chaos and possibly bloodshed. So the question here is, on the one hand, we want to promote democracies overseas, but at the same time, we also have to recognize that exporting an American form of democracy is not like a one-size-fits-all kind of thing, and we have to be willing to consider the fact that maybe our, you know, some, some of our, our beliefs about democracy are going to be more successful in some cultures, may take a better a foothold in some cultures than others, and be careful about some of the consequences of our actions as we try to promote democracy overseas. Now this is probably a pretty good time to stop and, uh, and, uh, for, for today. Uh, in our next session, we're going to be talking about sort of the making of foreign and defense policy, the different agencies that are involved, and the different kinds of uh, tools that we have uh, to engage in um, uh, influence of behavior, diplomatic tools that we have to, available to influence the behavior of other nations. So, until then, this is Patrick Scott. We'll see you next time.